A troubling trend that we've seen all across the nation, let's put this up there on the screen, we've seen a violent crime spike by about 30% with an overall decrease yet in property crime. We've also seen hate crime increase and more. Obviously, this is probably one of the most politically charged debates that exists. Charles Lehman, he's a friend of mine over at the Manhattan Institute, and he's very, you know, so, a very sober-minded person whenever it comes to looking at the data. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. Charles, tell us a little bit about specifically what we saw. There were a lot of narratives out there. Just break down the actual data itself is out. Where are there increase? Where are there decreases? What are some myths that have been busted? What are some that have been confirmed? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the top line, the FBI is the major entity that tracks this stuff. Uh, they look at a bunch of different figures, but sort of the, the standard way that we talk about this is that there are seven crimes, seven major crimes that they try to track consistently over time. And what we saw last year, 2020 versus 2019 is that there was a dramatic increase in homicide, about 30 order 30 percent, uh, smaller but still significant increases off of a off of a higher base uh, in aggravated assaults and grand theft auto, which are both about 11, 12 percent, and then declines in other classes of property crime, um, robbery, burglary, larceny. So robbery, burglary, order two, three percent, larceny increases big. Actually, I think the burglary increase was like eight percent. It decreased like eight percent. Larceny fell something like 10 percent. So you have the big synthetic picture that we saw in the FBI's data confirmed what we saw in city level data and state level data. Uh, there was a big increase in violence last year um, as measured by shootings and homicides. There was a notable precipitous decline in property offending last year, except with the exception of uh, Grand Theft Auto, which also rose substantially. Hmm. How do these numbers overall uh, and the geographic distribution of these numbers compare to like the, the crack epidemic in the late 80s and early 90s? Yeah. So the, the to answer both parts, uh, geographically, crime is less focused in certain cities than it used to be. Um, the majority, the overall majority of crime still happens in large cities. That's a phenomenon of where population is. The more people you have in one place, uh, the more crime is going to happen in that place for both just sort of population number reasons and also for concentration of people reasons. Um, but it is the case that we saw increases in rural and suburban areas in, in violent crime. It the increases, as far as we can tell, in big cities was bigger in overall magnitude. Um, but crime is overall less concentrated in the biggest cities than it used to be. Um, in terms of sort of historical context, in violent crime, we remain below where we were in the sort of peak of violence in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, there has been, so, you know, we saw this dramatic crime decline between 1991 and 94, and really 2008, 2009, 2010, and then there's really a leveling off in violent crime. Um, so on the one hand, we're still where, well below where we were a generation ago. On the other hand, last year's homicide increase in particular was the largest in terms of absolute numbers and percentage-wise um, record. And we were much closer to where we were in the 1980s and 1990s. Huh. I think there's a conversation to be had about whether we should expect a reversion to that norm. But uh, it's certainly the case that we are uh, close to the sort of high, closer to those sort of worst years of violent crime in recent memory. So, Charles, one thing that has in a lot of people's minds is COVID. People freaked out during COVID in, in many ways. I mean, one of the things that was a hallmark of 2020 is you can't buy any ammunition, and it was very difficult to buy a gun because there were lines that were out the door. Now, I've actually seen both sides of this argument. Many people are saying, see, increase in gun sales led to more homicides. The other one was, well, there's more homicides, so people feel the need, or people just feel really angry because of lockdowns and more. Can you disaggregate any of that? What do we know about that? Yeah, let me talk about COVID and guns separately because I think they're two different stories. Um, on the one hand, it's hard to suggest that COVID played no role in the relative increase. I mean, just sort of in general, if something weird happened in 2020, there has to have been some role for the biggest, weirdest thing that happened in 2020 in determining that. Um, and so I think it is it is improbable that COVID had no effect. Um, among other things, COVID led to large scale decarceration. So just like letting offenders out of jail is going to have an impact. You could say it was worth it, but it is going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I think there's some questions about if COVID can explain all of it. Most other developed countries did not experience a homicide increase last year. Uh, similarly, violent countries like Mexico or Honduras did not experience a homicide increase last year. Um, some of the armed countries did not experience a homicide increase last year. They were all affected often worse by COVID than we were. So there has to be something unique about the United States. Um, 
that isn't you know isn't adequately explained by COVID. Vis-a-vis guns, there was a historic increase in gun purchasing last year. March 2020 is, I think, the the most gun single single month background checks since the FBI started keeping track. There's like a lot of guns purchased. Um, that said. We know a couple of things. We know that it takes a long time for licitly purchased guns to move from the hands of licit owners to criminal owners. The ATF estimates it's about seven years on average. And we know that there isn't a correlation between the states that saw the most gun purchase increases and the states that saw the largest homicide increases. Mm. Um, there is some evidence that there was an increase in gun carrying last year, that people were like walking around with guns more. Um I think it is it is plausible that that also played a role in the violence increase. Uh, although, sort of understanding why people did that sort of you know pushes right. but moves the goalpost a little bit. It's like why did people make that change? That makes sense. Charles, one of the things that's difficult about this data is, first of all, as Sagar alluded to, everyone projects their own sort of like political inclinations onto it. So if you're on the left, you may be more likely to point to, you know, you had this massive economic crash, you had COVID, you had these huge life disruptions. If you're on the right, you may be more likely to point to the social justice protests that we had and the backlash against police shootings and what that may have done. You know, honestly, there was very little policy change in terms of policing, but what that may have done to police officer morale and those sorts of things. So very easy to project whatever your favorite hypothesis is onto this sort of data. And it seems to me very hard to actually get at the answers. I mean, people are still debating why you had these massive spikes and then even more critically, why you ultimately had a massive decline that you pointed to around uh, 1994. There are all sorts of different competing explanations here. So is it even really possible with these sets of data to actually come to an answer about what happened? Why did we have this spike in this year? And now it seems like things are trending in a better direction in 2021. You know, why is that the case? Is it even really possible to sort of figure those things out? Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is at the highest level, no, it's not. Um, at, the, at, at the highest level of certainty, we can't know because so many different events happened simultaneously. It's And this is true across the board, disentangling the effects of COVID from the effects of protests, from the effects of you know, policies that were caused by COVID is impossible, um, certainly with the degree of certainty that econometricians, social scientists want. That said, I think you can get suggestive evidence. Um, mm-hmm. You can say, you know, what are, I, I tend to think that there's a significant role played by, by general, by a decline in police levels and uh, police activity that was related to uh, the protests that you alluded to. Um, I think that for a couple of reasons. One is that there really are in many large cities immediate dramatic spikes in violence just after the protests begin. The sort of timing is very suggestive. And another is that we have seen, again, in large cities, dramatic declines in police staffing levels and in police activity. Um, I think that's not a dispositive explanation. And you can't ever you're, – you're right. You can't say – Well, because the other, certain, piece be like that, the, cause the other piece is that you know this happened across the country. So it's widely geographically distributed. So it's hard to say that's the whole of what was going on here, right? Yeah. And I think the most persuasive story is going to be multi-causal. That, again, I think it is it is hard to say that COVID had no effect. We have no good estimates of what de-incarceration as a COVID policy had. We, we have no idea because we don't have great measures of how many people are in jail on, every, on any single day. Um, we don't have a good estimate of what the different COVID policies did. Uh, so I think it is the, the best and most persuasive story is going to be a multi-causal one right. where we say there are a bunch of different factors and it's hard to disentangle them, but we have suggestive evidence for what is more and less important. My last question, Charles, is about where things are trending. Um, and so we had a terrible year in 2020. What does the city state level data look like right now? Are we going to continue to have the same level spike? Is it going to return to the baseline somewhere in the middle? What do things look like? So based on what we know so far, uh, rates of homicide and violent crime are still elevated above 2019. They're slightly elevated above or slightly below where they were in 2020. So uh, basically, the, you know, the, mm. we're, we're about where we were last year, which is not great by comparison to the baseline. Um, if that's going to revert long term, that's an open question. You know, we saw a big homicide spike 2015, 2016, and then we were it, there was there was mean reversion. Um, oh, I would 
yeah. guess that the same thing will happen in 2022. You know, I think we're not my guess is we're not going to see another crime wave for the simple reason that, you know, demographic factors and structural factors militate against it. But I would not be surprised if 2021 is as bad as 2020. And then we sort of see a return to normal. That's my least worst guess at this time. Interesting. Thank you so much, Charles, for helping us sort through this data and make sense of it. We're really grateful. Thank you, Charles. I Absolutely. appreciate it, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. All right, everybody. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Crystal, we literally already got the news that one of our segments has been demonetized. Really? The show's not even over, um, but our production team is uploading stuff kind of as we go. I was checking my email in between, and it's already there. Hmm. So look, here's the deal. The only way that we can make sure that we do the show exactly the way that we need to is if you guys support us. Become a premium subscriber. I mean, it makes it so that we don't have to worry about both customer experience and in terms of what's important and what's not. We're going to pick the topics that we need to, or let's say if we want to play a clip but we're worried about copyright or something, we should play the clip to make sure that everybody's getting the most important news of the day rather than us having to game some monetization algorithm. Yeah, 100%. I mean— you know, one thing we talk a lot about on the show is incentives, the way they shape yes. human behavior, and we want all of our incentives to be aligned in just providing you the content that we think is important, right. that we think needs sorting through, and, you know, bringing that to you in as direct and straightforward a way as possible. And so we intentionally created this particular model to help enable us to do that. So you guys are the best. Thank you for being there for us. I'm actually surprised. I'm looking at the segments. I'm like, what got demonetized? <laughs> I, you know, normally you I don't have it. Predict I don't have it here. Which just, things are they didn't edgy? Title it yet. Yeah, which things right. are edgy and which might be, you know, they might find like, oh, you said the word Syria. I can't <laughs> right. have that or whatever. <laughs> 9/11. I don't even know with this one, so All we'll right. find out. But thank you guys for being there for us. We love you. Have a great day, and we'll see you back here on Thursday. See you Thursday. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.